Tansi, Abwashdan, everybody. My name is Sissy Thiessen Kutneo, and I come from the northwestern part of Turtle Island. My family comes from Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation out in Alberta. And this is going to be a three part mini series about introduction to terminology, protocol, teachings, and footwork of women's powwow dance styles. This is a collaboration between myself and Yellow Head Institute to help address um, policy areas of physical activity as well as cultural, cultural integration. Um, so today what I really want to get into is um, why we dance, why are we doing what we're doing, um, what is our intention, the stories of each style, introduction to regalia, terminology and protocols, as well as how to prepare yourself and prepare yourself for dance and care for your regalia. Um, so right now I am just putting, I put some bear grease in my hair, um, which I had bought, actually bought online from some people out in Ontario area and their business is called truecanadianart.com. So bear grease, this is looking like a, this is looking like a, a YouTube, a beauty YouTube channel. So I do my braids, um, I just do old style braids, not French. Um, you can do any of these, well, typically older style braids is for old style jingle or old style fancy or traditional. Um, so if you're doing contempt fancy, contempt jingle, um, you would do French braids, but I like to do old style. I like to part it off to the side. I, I do mine pretty pretty quick and pretty quick and easy. Use my finger. A lot of times I find myself as a dancer getting ready outside of my car or just getting stuffed into a broom closet or I've also changed it in porta potties at, at powwows. <laughs> it's just whatever is available, um, practicing some resilience and flexibility. So what I do is I take my hair make it as smooth and as tight as I can. And right below my ear, I'm going to put my hair elastics. Now, the reason why I put a hair elastic on top is number one, I have pretty thin braids. And number two, um, I'm gonna be sticking some otter furs. And when we dance, we don't want any of our regalia to be falling off. And so when I can stick my fur ties through my hair up here, the hair elastic will hold it in place from falling because my very first time hitting the powwow arena about oh geez six and a half years ago that's how long i've been dancing um the first time hitting the arena my one of my ties fell off and i was lucky enough to catch it because none of our regalia is supposed to touch the ground so i'm doing it on the other side so making it as tight as possible I actually have naturally curly hair, so this is <laughs> this is pretty tough. So I got my other got my other hair elastic here. Okay, so even if they're not perfectly even, it doesn't matter because I'm gonna be covering them with my otter furs. So what I do is I take um so so three strands are for mind, body, and spirit. And I also just wanted to say right now that I do recognize that teachings are supposed to happen in person. Um, and that's a traditional way to do things. But with our current environment, with this virus, and the social isolation mandates going on right now, we're doing what we can. And I think this knowledge is really important um, to get out to people. So we are braiding because we want health and prosperity in mind, body, and spirit for ourselves. As well as our hair, I got the teaching, carries the culture, stories, um, and spirits of our families. So that's why it's important. That's why we grow our hair. That's why we braid our hair. And when something kind of life-altering happens or um, a life is lost in our family and has some extreme life change that tests us um, some people will cut their hair 
So like I said, I myself have really, I don't have a whole lot of hair. Um, I, I have a medical condition, but I do the best I can. And I actually struggled with uh, wanting to dance because I thought you had to look an exact certain way. I thought you had to have thick, straight black hair. And I thought you had to look like a very specific kind of dancer. But I've learned to embrace um, who I am and to be proud of what I have. And that wearing regalia is dressing up our spirit. Yeah, when we put on our regalia, we are dressing our spirit. And it can be important in competition to have the nicest matching beadwork and regalia. But really, if we're doing, if we're looking at things from a traditional sense, it's about how does your spirit look? How do you want to dress it? What is your family's? Are there patterns or designs that are in your family that you want to carry on with pride? I'll show you my, um, I'll show you my moccasins, my high top moccasins that I made. So you'll see these common with traditional, with traditional dancers, as well as old style jinkles. So those bear paws are because of my great grandmother, who was the matriarch in our family. Um, she is my guide and my protector, and I see her in visions, and I see her in ceremony. And um, the bears are medicine keepers, and my great-grandmother was a medicine keeper. So um, when I dance, the reason I have those bear paws is so she can dance with me, and that's so her spirit is here with me. I also was told that if we dance with any furs, so I will be showing you how I put on my um, otter furs. This is a beautiful, beautiful otter fur that I'll use as a hair tie onto my, onto my braids that I had got at a... Um, I actually purchased my very first dress. It came with a few things, including those otter ties, my very first jingle dress. And I got it in uh, Musquatchies or Hobima here in Alberta. And I was told that anytime you wear a fur or part of an animal, not to feel sorry and not to feel bad because that animal's spirit is going to live on through your dancing. So that's what I think about when I think about my otter ties and the hide I used. I made my own moccasins. So ways that you can... Um, obtain regalia is it can get gifted to you so when I do my regalia tour later um, I'll show you uh, I'll show you the things that have been gifted to me um, and that happens in a lot of like traditional families or families where there are lots of dancers I don't come from a family like that and so mine has kind of come from community and other dancers I've met at performances and just people that I've built relationship with that's a lot of our culture is building relationships with people, adopting each other spiritually, and it's been just a really beautiful process connecting back to culture I didn't have growing up um, through through dancing and getting all these teachings from, from dancers, from other dancers who've been dancing for a long time, who I look up to and admire. Okay, so I'm going to secure the ends, baby, baby, baby ends of my braids. Um, with some more berries here. So I'm just putting it through. So I am lucky slash unlucky enough that I don't really need ties for the bottoms of my braids because they're so small. <laughs> so I got my bear grease on here. And what I'm gonna do is take this, I'm gonna rub that grease because I don't wanna get those too oily. I'm gonna take these otter hair ties and so what I do is I take, um, I've only ever seen them where you tie them. I guess there are some clips, but taking um, one side, making a little loop like that, pushing it through the top of our braid. So we're, we're remembering that we don't want our regalia to touch the ground. Then it becomes an offering. So what I'm doing is I've got, I've got it through now. I'm trying to take the other side and just wrap my entire braid in the fur. 
And so I've gone around the back with the tie. I'm crossing it at the top. Crossing it at the top. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go down. I leave about an inch between each cross. And I'm also making sure my braid is in the fur at the back. You don't want your braid sticking out. And I've had people actually mistake my otter ties for my hair, which I find really funny. Okay. Not a candy person at all. There we go. <laughs> so we've got the braid behind. We've got it started at the top. We want that, that fur going as far up as it possibly can. And I'm just being extra fussy. Um, now a lot of dancers will use hairspray or mousse and make sure that all those flyaways, once you dance, you get sweaty. Especially outside in the summer. I've danced in as hot as like in the 30 degrees areas and oh my gosh. So again, it's nice to have things perfect and even. But there's also beauty and imperfection. I had another dancer who's been dancing 30 years or something or more tell me that um, some crafters and dancers will on purpose make sure that the work isn't perfect because nothing is perfect. As people, we are imperfect. Every creation on Mother Earth is imperfect. And so to just remember that, it's really easy to get caught up in that mentality of gotta look like everybody else, gotta have what everybody else has. So I've gone all the way down to where my braid stops so I can see my little tufts here. You can see my little tufts sticking out there and I think that's far enough for me. Um, and I also have to look to see how much of these strings I have left. So I don't have a whole lot of these strings left. So what I'll do is I'll just do one more crossover in the front and bring it to the back. And I just do a simple double knot. If you have enough, you can do a bow. The thing about a bow is it sticks out on both sides. And you can see that. And again, you know, if that matters to you, cool. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, So then uh, I have different, so these are, this is beadwork. This is traditional Lakota Sioux or stony beadwork. I actually got down in the Banff area. Um, just for sake of time, I'm just gonna do one otter tie. So this is a, so headbands can be worn like this, like that, or headbands can also be worn like this. So again, you either get it gifted, you make it yourself, um, and the idea with the gifting is that you earn it, you know, someone believes that you've done something where you earned, so traditionally, um, like with, for example, with a jingle dress, the combs, so the jingles, you would earn every single comb. You would earn every single cone or jingle on your dress, and traditionally there's 365 to represent each day of the year. So this is a tie. A lot of the stuff is tie up, a lot of mine is anyway. I've also seen Velcro, Velcro headbands where you just Velcro it to your hair, but that terrifies me, so you just stick it on some Velcroed. Um, or it's just elastic at the back there, so that's also a lot more um, accessible. I like to put my ears down, I like to make sure my hair, and the idea is for this to pull back my hair so it's not in my face. Um, this is my... Sorry about that, that's my cat. Uh, this is my cook'em scarf. So we know that floral patterns, cook'em and Cree is a uh, grandmother. Cook'em in Stony is a uh, mugshin. It's on your father's side. I don't actually know what it is for mother's side because I only have that family on my father's side. And so when I'm dancing sometimes, I will have my cook'em scarf and I will tie it here or I will hold it in my hand. And the way that I hold it in my hand um, so it doesn't fall on the ground is to grab the tail, wrap it around the hand, and holding it like this. 
also because cookum scarves are really long. So we know that floral patterns represent our grandmothers because they are beautiful and delicate and just the center of all of our families. So that's my cookum scarf. I'll just put it up here for now. And you know, some people use it as a cape. As jingle dress, I've seen that jingle dress dancers traditional, and I don't think I've seen that with fancy, so you're kind of putting it so, and a cape, the idea is a cape will hold down a shawl, um, a dress, a shirt, whatever you happen to have. So it can be beaded, it can be just straight hide, but yeah, so I would put it, make sure it goes across my shoulders, and I would tie it in a knot or something like that. So I had mentioned that it's important to know why, why you're dancing. Um, so I've been taught that we dance for those who cannot dance for themselves. We dance for, we dance for those who have passed on. We dance for, and then the styles themselves have different stories and meanings behind each. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you a tour of my regalia really quickly. Um, again, my apologies, I'm not much of a camera person. <laughs> so this is the case I use. It is hideous and red and snakeskin, so I'll never lose it. I've got numbers in here from different pals that I've danced at. Got me missing a murder indigenous women sign upside down. So this is my belt which I will dance with and it has cookum scarves. It has cookum scarves attached to it which I've seen in all three styles of the women's dances. This is my cape that I had mentioned earlier, so it's made entirely of hide. I eventually want to have one that is fully beaded. And then I keep my things in bags just in case it does rain. Um, they have some extra protection. I've got some other hair ties in here. I have some beadwork. Um, so these weasels were gifted to me by an elder dancer who I really respect and has given me some teachings. Um, and those are Thunderbirds. And then in here, I also have um, I have my feather box. So right now, I, I have this imitation plume, which I will wear to the side. Because when I dance fancy, I dance old style fancy. And typically, you wear um, the plume on, on the top of your head like this. But contempt will wear it up like that. Okay, so why you're dancing. Let's get into some of the stories. Stories of creation of the different styles. This is also, this is my fan. Um, typically, uh, traditional and jingle dancers will have uh, eagle feather fans. Um, I am still learning on how to acquire one of those um, with authentic feathers or imitation feathers. But I know the feathers are typically earned and um, you can come upon the feathers uh, through fish and wildlife who um, happens to find, happens to come upon an eagle that has died of natural causes and you can be put on the list and um, get contacted uh, to receive the bird that way and get the feathers that way and then make the fan yourself or contact somebody who does in the community and there's lots of people or you can also trade for it. Um, but again, doing our best to earn what we have. There we go, that's better light. There we go, we got our one otter, we got our one otter tie, also um, promo for Kiwait and Clothing. Uh, it's de a designer 
um, from here in the western part of Turtle Island. So this is a dress that was gifted to me by another dancer. It's beautiful, beautiful red dress. I use it to raise awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, we've got a handprint on there. That's actually her son's handprint. And it was just so, so moving to receive this gift. Um, so this dress, this is for fancy. It's not a tea dress, but traditional dancers will have something like this. It goes a lot longer, it goes all the way down to the ground, and the arms will be a lot wider. And some of them will have some leather fringe hanging down off of it. Um, it's the most, it's the oldest and most graceful and beautiful, I've been told, of all the styles. And it comes from, I'll show you kind of what the fringe on the arm looks like. So I actually have a fancy shawl that was made and um, sold to me by that same dancer who gifted me those weasel hair ties that I really just love and appreciate. So what I've done is I have safety pinned my this fancy shawl to um, be suitable for to be suitable for traditional. Now it's been in there a little while. I haven't brought it out for a bit because of the quarantine. Um, so I'm just going to try to move back here. So I would have it on my arm. And when I danced, I'm just going to flip it so you can see that. And when I dance, so I would have my hands, um, I would actually have my fan in this hand. I've always seen the fan in the right, and this is, um, this is some fringe so that when I stand, and I'm bouncing with my knees. This moves. So how this dance originated was um, the men or the warriors would come back from war or hunting parties and they'd be gone for quite a while. When they came back, they'd make a grand entry and they would do the footwork of, you know, how they dodged the arrows or, or the bullets or how they caught the animal and they would show the steps. So that's the traditional men's dance. So they're holding, you know, they do a stomp do different patterns with their feet and they crouch down and things like that to kind of, kind of imitate that war or the hunting that happened and how they survived and came back with an animal. Um, and so when they came back, the women would stand on the outside in a tea dress, like I said. So it's just a tea here with a big sleeve with fringe and it was all made out of high traditionally all the way down to the ground, however long they could make it with fringe on the bottom. And they would stand so that when they moved the fringe, they would stand and just bend their knees on the outside being supportive. And that's how we as dancers do this in the Powell Circle. This is how we show support um, for each other when we're competing or we're exhibitioning. Exhibitioning means you're just dancing and you're not competing for any uh, cash prize. There's a lot of dancers who will do that traditionally and then at traditional powwows, non-contest powwows, um, there is no, there is no competition. Um, yeah, so the traditional women's would just stand on the outside and bend their knees and show the support on the outside of the circle. With that high tea, high tea dress. And now we're seeing things in traditional women's regalia with fully beaded tops and capes that have the really long hide fringe. Um, or we just see straight up cloth dresses with some ribbon work on the bottom or some shells. There's lots of different variations of it. And so the next would be our jingle dress dance. That's the one I started as because I really liked the style. I really love the story of creation of the jingle dress dance and what it stands for.
So I'm gonna show you my very first dress. And I'm just really trying to increase the knowledge and the inspiration. So try to connect our people back to the Powell Circle because the, all these dances started as prayer and ceremony and that's what I believe they still are. So this is my very first jingle dress that I had purchased in uh, Muscat Cheese and it has about 110 cones I think on it and um, like I said traditionally it's 365 which would make it very very heavy. The story I received from another dancer who had been dancing for quite a while so these dancers I've got these teachings and stories from have been from Blackfoot Territory Treaty 7, uh, have been from Saskatchewan and have been from Alberta. Um, really amazing women who uh, open their spirits to me and I'll forever be grateful. So Jingle Dress Dance, story I was told, and there's been different variations, but essentially the same thing that it is a healing dance. Um, the story I got was that there was a young girl out in the eastern part of Turtle Island um, in Ontario, uh, what we now call Ontario, in the Anishinaabe territory, whose mother was very sick and was on her deathbed. And the little girl had a dream that she went to the beach and she collected some shells because these are jingles or cones and they are metal. Traditionally, it was not, uh, this, this wasn't available, I don't believe, at the time. And so she had grabbed some shells and she sewed it onto a dress. She put the dress on, she did a dance. When she did the dance, it made a noise. made a noise similar to the sound of rain. So when she did this dance, it sounded like rain and the rain came. And when the rain came, it was cleansing. And we believe that water is sacred, water is life, and water purifies and cleanses. So when that water and the rain came, it cleansed the earth, it cleansed the community, and her mother actually got better. There's been different variations of that where it's a grandfather and it was a little girl who was sick, but it does rely on a dream and a vision, which are really important to us as First Nations people, and um, doing a dance for healing. And so I've heard this dance introduced at powwows as, now for the dance for Mother Earth, now for the dance for healing. And I actually participated in a few healing circles where they called all Jingle Just Dancers to the Arbor. That's what the dance area is called, to the Arbor, the circle, the Powell circle. And, um, they said all Jingle Dress Dancers to the Arbor and we had actually, and I've actually danced around people who are really sick, who are battling cancer, the person in their family, and it's just really powerful and I really, really believe in the healing medicine of this style. And that's why I started with this one. And then next, we have Fancy Shawl. So as I mentioned, um, I have my my fancy shawl here and it's all pinned up to dance traditional um the fancy shawl i was told originated um as essentially an evolution from traditional so traditional having that fringe wearing it on your body and then having it on your arm and now this is kind of an evolution to wearing the um wearing the shawl or the ribbon or fringe on on your back so putting it across your shoulders which I'll show you once I get this unpinned because I am working on building my regalia like I said I've been dancing for six and a half years so it does take quite a bit of time to get um, a completed set for every single step thank you so much for joining me today for the introduction part one of Pow Wow 101 which is an introduction to women's styles of powwow dance. Today we went over the stories of origin for jingle dress, traditional, and we are about to learn more about fancy shawl um, in part two. Today we also talked about regalia, terminology, caring for regalia, a little bit about ethics. 
Um, so stay tuned for more about fancy shell dancing um, and getting deeper into ethics as well as some music from Bear Hill in the next one. Ish niche, ai hai.